Hello, this is Gary C. King. It's been a while since my last podcast, but this is one I've been looking forward to doing. Today I'm going to talk about an earlier book of mine called To Die For. It was previously titled Blind Rage. For women with a yin for macho men, Darren D. O'Neill seemed the kind of guy romantic dreams were made of. Strong, handsome, smooth-talking, with an array of tattoos adding to his masculine aura. He came on as a rugged outdoorsman looking for a mate, but in reality, O'Neill was a nightmare of savage, sexually violent crimes that put him on the FBI's most wanted list. Here is the bone-chilling true story of the twisted killer whose masterful ability to change appearances confounded authorities again and again, and a mother's agonizing search for her missing daughter. It is the story, too, of the brilliant police work and startling psychic detection that teamed with the family's outrage to bring him to justice. But it was too late for a young woman whose dream of a hunk to die for became a reality. How I found this project is how I'd like to get started. One day back in the early 1990s, I was perusing the internet in its early days, and I found a newspaper article about a murder in Washington State, Robin Smith, What interested me especially about this was the involvement of Robin's mother, Edna Smith, and her family in trying to find out what had actually happened to uncover the victim's remains and to bring about justice. I learned about the case and I immediately contacted Edna, and I really wasn't expecting her to respond to me. So many people don't in situations like this, understandably so. But Edna got back to me right away and said that she would be very interested in me writing a book about the case. She said that she'd been approached by other writers and she'd turned them all down. But she had done a little research on me and found that she liked the kind of writing that I did, my style, the truthfulness of it, and so forth. She didn't want anything at all from me except that I tell the story in a true and factual manner not to leave out any of the details, nothing to spare her or her family. She wanted the story told. To me, that was a very reasonable request on her part. I readily agreed to it. My wife and I, we made plans to make a trip up to the Tacoma, Washington area, and we spent several days with Edna and her family. During that time, they shared their stories about Robin, her youth, growing up. They opened up their pictures, their albums, shared all of those with us. And there was a lot of emotion involved. During this time, a lot of crying. We ended up crying right along with them. It taught me a few things about empathy, how to deal with victims of crime. It was a very valuable process for me as a writer. It actually changed my life in the way that I viewed writing about victims and crimes and criminals. I just wanted to share that little tidbit with you. Along the way, I learned also that there's really no such thing as closure. We hear about the word closure all the time in relationship to true crimes and murders and victims and so forth. And while it's a a nice thought, we want these people to certainly find closure. The truth of the matter is they never do. They relive the crimes over and over again and again for the rest of their lives, even after justice has been sought and found. Therefore, like I said, I don't believe in closure. It just doesn't exist. I kind of abhor the the word anymore. I, I try not to use it unless I'm using it quoted material. But at any rate, I wanted to see the case files. I contacted the Pierce County Sheriff's Department told them what I was doing while I was up there. They contacted Edna and made sure it was okay with her and her family that I see these files. And then they got the okay from the sheriff and he readily agreed since no one else had any objections. And by this time, of course, the the case had been fully adjudicated. So there was really no reason for me not to see them. So during this this same visit, I spent a couple of days at the sheriff's department. They were very hospitable in talking to me about Darren O'Neill and crimes, search for Robin Smith. Detective Terry Wilson had one of the secretaries make copies. I left with the entire case file. Getting into Darren O'Neill, he was a wannabe mountain man, so to speak. He voraciously read Louis L'Amour Western novels and he fantasized about some of the characters in those novels. He saw himself as one of those characters. In fact, throughout the case, he occasionally adopted variations of the names of some of those people in the books that he used as aliases. He was a man with a Marlboro man persona. There was no doubt in my mind that had he been able to fulfill his fantasies, he would have found himself a woman and actually moved into the woods and lived out at least part of his life, at least long enough to where he'd think about some of the crimes that he had committed, relive them, and plan future ones. Of course, such a a lifestyle wouldn't last for someone like him because serial killers typically become addicted to killing. 
it would only be a matter of time before he would be on the road again searching for victims and either murder or discard whatever woman that he may have found as a wife. The story itself actually starts in the Twin Peaks area of northwestern Washington state. And I refer to it as the Twin Peaks area simply because of the darkness of the TV show by that same name and the fact that that show very adequately described this area. Darren O'Neill was clearly a drifter, and that's how he was known to his family and friends and many people in law enforcement that would eventually become acquainted with him. He had traveled extensively throughout the United States, was actually the product of an army household. His travels had begun in his youth and continued until his father finally retired from the military and settled down with Darren's mother in Colorado Springs. But for reasons, dark reasons, that no one yet fully understood, Darren continued to travel in his adult life entirely of his own doing, out of necessity in most cases in order to stay one step ahead of the law, as he was doing by the time he arrived in northwestern Washington. He was almost always on the move never remaining in one location very long. And as a result, he didn't bond very well with others. Any bonds that he made were short-lived. He had barely $200 in his wallet when he arrived in Washington State, and he worked at odd jobs and ran scams with street people to get by, occasionally robbing people on the street who were either too drunk to know what was happening, or they just couldn't put up enough resistance to avoid any attacks by him. But robbery was definitely in his modus operandi. Along the way, he'd worked as a casual laborer, cook, bartender, tender, dishwasher, warehouseman, salesperson, wood laminator, and so forth. So he really didn't have any trouble finding work. It just didn't last very long. By the time he arrived in northwestern Washington, or soon thereafter, he obtained a job as a cabinet maker. The Robin Smith story really begins shortly after O'Neill arrived in Washington State. She and her fiancé, Laren Crouston, had gone to a tavern in Puyallup called Baldy's. And they were enjoying drinks and the camaraderie. And little did they know, Darren O'Neill was sitting across the room with his eye on Robin. He watched her for some time, finally consulted one of the waitresses that worked there and said that he was having an after-hours party at his house after Baldy's closed. And would she please introduce him to Robin and her fiancé? The waitress agreed, and that's how Robin actually met Darren O'Neill. It was almost like an act of fate. So they end up finishing their evening at Baldi's, and they go over to Darren's house, kind of a shack, really. They have their after-hours party, and Robin, being young, she's really enjoying herself, not wanting to leave. Laren, on the other hand, had a fishing trip planned for the next day, so he had to get up early, and he wanted to leave, but Robin wouldn't hear. As a result, she asked him to let her stay at Darren's party, and that she would get a ride home with someone else. That turned out to be a very big mistake, a fatal mistake, as Robin was last seen at Darren's party. When Robin fails to return home, her family's just worried sick. Her mother, Edna, is just beside herself, and she contacts the local police, and they basically tell her that they have to wait a certain period of time. In most cases, it's 72 hours. This was so out of character for Robin not to come home or to show up or let anyone know if there was anything wrong. The police reluctantly agreed to take a missing persons report. So with Robin missing, the missing person report filed, no sign of her, the worry of the family, the case basically remains dormant as no one has seen or heard from her. Not her friends, not her family, no sightings. The police really don't know where to go with it. They do the usual background checks, they do the inquiries with the friends and relatives, and just nothing. Robin has just vanished. Soon thereafter, and this is found out later when the family does some of their own investigating, O'Neill shows up at the home of a friend. He's wanting to borrow some money, unsuccessful in that avenue. But while there, the friend notices noises coming from the trunk of O'Neill's Chrysler New Yorker, which was stolen, by the way. He sees movement from the back seat, like someone pushing from the trunk into the back seat. And when he asks O'Neill what's going on, O'Neill told him he had a couple of dogs in the trunk that he was having to deal with. The friend, he's thinking, well, this is really despicable to do that to a dog. Little did anyone know, later evidence would show up that Robin Smith was likely inside his trunk, still alive. One point early on in the investigation, 
the Smith family, seeing that they're getting little or no results from the police, despite all the work that's being done, the efforts that the police are trying, they take it upon themselves to backtrack Robin's last moments. And they start by going to Baldy's Tavern and learning about the after-hours party at O'Neill's house. And they show up at O'Neill's house and ask questions of his live-in girlfriend at the time, trying to find out generally what had happened, when was the last time anyone had seen Robin, and so forth. Really, they confirmed that Robin had been there. There was little other information that was given to them that they could work on from that point. By this time, Darren O'Neill had disappeared. No one knew where he was at, not even his live-in girlfriend. So Darren O'Neill's girlfriend moves out. She she goes back to wherever she was from, basically leaves the house that he had rented empty. So Edna Smith and her family make another trip over there on a different occasion and decide that they're going to search this house. They didn't have any search warrants. The police couldn't get any, so they didn't search it right away. When they went there, they were shocked at some of the things that they found. Among them was a black skull candle and another skull that may have been real. It hasn't been confirmed, but it looked like a child's skull and had numbers painted on it. This was obviously very disturbing. They found other things that led them to start questioning what kind of person O'Neill was. A little background on Robin, probably in order. She had grown up in a fairly normal childhood. She was always basically a good girl. She made lots of friends easily. She was respectful towards her family and her mother. Everyone loved her. At some point along the way, she had met Laren Crouston. The two fell instantly in love with each other. They had a fairly lengthy engagement. They made plans to be married. Laren thought the world of her. They went everywhere together. One such occasion, they went to a flea market in Tacoma. For whatever reason, Laren had a dime, a ten-cent piece, dipped into a gold-like substance. So it became essentially a gold dime that he gave to Robin. She carried it with her everywhere. I never was really sure of the significance of it other than the fact that Laren had given it to her. It became almost a central point in the case, in the investigation, and some of the weird things that turned up happening. After Robin disappeared, the family began finding dimes, regular dimes, all over the place. Here, there, everywhere they would go, they would find a dime. At some point, they started taking these findings to be messages from Robin, whether they were or not as anyone's guess, but the family believed this. Uh, there's no doubt about it. At one point, a friend of the family went to a store in Tacoma, ironically named O'Neill's Market. She went in and purchased some cigarettes and some other items. In the change that was given back to her was a gold dime. She nearly fell on the floor when she saw it. This was a strong indication that either Robin had been there or someone else had been there and used the dime to buy something. It seemed really strange to me as a writer that it turned out to be a market named O'Neill's and the fact that this particular gold dime had shown up there. Again, it's not evidentiary quality material, but it was enough to instill more hope in the family's eyes that Robin was alive or, if not, that she would be found. At one point, O'Neill had been married to a woman named June Hodges. By the time that Robin Smith had been missing for a while, sightings of O'Neill had begun to be reported. Here, there, an area around Mount Rainier, different places. And one of the things that confirmed the sightings was the fact that he had the name June tattooed on the fingers, one letter for each finger, across his left hand. Really, it just opened up another avenue for the cops to work on. The result, they actually went to talk to June to see if O'Neill had been in touch with her to learn additional background on him that she might be able to provide. They couldn't find June. They didn't know where she lived. They had a pretty undaunting task of trying to track her down. In the meantime, a family friend, Jim Cheney, for some inexplicable reason, suddenly wanted to travel to an area near Greenwater, Washington, and begin conducting searches for Robin there. Apparently they'd gone camping there at one time or another, the family. For reasons that aren't clear, even to this day, why Jim had these feelings, these strong urges to search this area is quite bizarre. It's one of the other bizarre elements that I uncovered during the investigation of this case. Greenwater was a small community about an hour due east of Tacoma, situated on the outer perimeter of the northeast sector of Mount Rainier National Park. Jim actually conceded as much to himself as to the Smith family that there was no rhyme or reason for him to want to go to Greenwater. It was just something that he couldn't get out of his mind. Perhaps it was because he, Laren, 
and Robin had gone camping in that area in the past, or perhaps it was something about O'Neill's fascination with the rugged outdoors that compelled him to want to search there. Everybody else wanted to conduct searches initially in the area around where O'Neill had lived, but Jim insisted on Greenwater as a place of significance. He and Mike Baker, Robin's brother-in-law, drove up there in Mike's small, white four-wheel drive Toyota pickup. As a matter of caution, they took their guns, just in case they ran into O'Neill or some other undesirable up there in the vast forests. Keeping in mind, this is also Green River Killer territory. Who knows what they might find up there, because as readers of true crime well know, the Green River Killer's areas of operation were quite vast in in this part of Washington State. Here's a short passage from the book. I think I'll just read it to you because it pretty much says it all, especially about the searches that were conducted in Greenwater. They drove through the area around Greenwater, taking many different roads, some of which took them through areas where mountain cabins were nestled among dense clusters of Douglas fir. It was as if he was merely feeling his way along, waiting for a sign of some sort to tell him which way to go. Their meandering went on for some time and eventually began to seem aimless. However, shortly after passing through Greenwater, Jim told Mike to slow down. To this day, he's not sure why he did it, but he picked a narrow, nearly impassable dirt and gravel road that turned to the right off Highway 410, known as both Huckleberry Creek Road and Forest Service Road No. 73, and instructed Mike to take it. It was strictly a gut hunch on Jim's part. He, Laren, and Robin had driven down that same road a year or so earlier looking for a campsite, and both Robin and Laren had protested. They had said, no way, not here, and Jim had gotten that same feeling. It was just too eerie a place to want to spend the night in the outdoors. As a result, they had found another location, one that wasn't so isolated to set up camp. Now, a year later, here he was again, on that same eerie road searching for his missing friend, not really knowing why he had been compelled to return there. Right after Mike had turned onto the road, Jim instructed him to take the first fork to the right. They drove down the road perhaps a half mile, then pulled over and parked at what appeared to be a fairly fresh campsite. When they got out of the truck, for some reason the fact that the campsite had recently been used and the eeriness of the forest frightened them both. It scared them so much that the hair stood up on their arms, almost as if being drawn outward by static electricity. They quickly decided, or perhaps just hoped, that it was only the intense quietude that was bothering them. It was so quiet that it seemed unearthly, so still that it paradoxically seemed noisy to them, like dead silence had suddenly become loud. They looked quizzically at each other, each obviously as frightened as the other. Jim, I don't know how you're feeling, but something is going on here, Mike had said, suddenly breaking the silence. Something has happened here. Jim agreed. During my interviews with the family and my investigation of this case, Jim Cheney took myself and my wife to this area of Greenwater. And I can say from first-hand experience, it was a very eerie place that just really gives one the willies. Uh, Later on, we find out that Jim had been pretty accurate in his feelings of wanting to search that area, as we'll get into. Edna's family and a few of their friends spent the next few days searching the isolated roads and trails around Greenwater to no avail. There was just so much land and water up there, literally hundreds of square miles, in which Robin's body could have been discarded. It was all so discouraging. Brenda, Robin's sister who was five months pregnant, was fast becoming disheartened, in part because she was worried about her health as well as that of her unborn baby. She wasn't eating or sleeping well, and the search was clearly beginning to take its toll on her. But she, like the others, refused to give up. Every night, upon returning home after a day of searching, Brenda kept praying, asking for a sign of some kind so that they would know whether they were even searching in the right area or not. It soon became a ritual of sorts with her, but it offered her encouragement and hope. In fact, the night before yet another planned trip to Greenwater, Brenda prayed especially long and hard. For whatever reason, whether it was a divine sign from God, a spiritual message from her sister, or just a macabre nightmare, Brenda had another dream. That night, Brenda fell asleep and dreamed about a dog with no head. It was there, in the forest somewhere, all alone, and without the presence of any people or other animals. Despite the intensely disturbing nature of the dream, Brenda described it to everyone the next morning just before they set out on another search of the Greenwater area. The dog, she said, was gold in color. Shortly after commencing the search in the woods that day, trampling through a soft cover of freshly fallen snow in a small clearing, Brenda and her husband, Mike, Jim, and another family friend stopped dead in their tracks. There in front of them was a dog, its coat golden blonde in color, just like the dog in Brenda's dream. It was attached to a leash, 
but when they approached it, the dog remained motionless. It looked strange, as though its head was burrowed into the ground, with its body protruding outward. When they walked all the way up to it, they suddenly realized that its head was missing. The dog, they noticed, had been dead for only a couple of days at most. They searched for the dog's head, but could not find it. They did find a portion of a newspaper with blood on it, and in this initially concerned them. However, it was later determined that the blood wasn't of human origin. The new grotesque discovery was indeed chilling, and it frightened all of them. It wasn't just another coincidence, as the police would call it, at least not in their minds, and they didn't buy the police theory that the animal had been decapitated at some sort of sick cult ritual, perhaps satanic. They viewed it instead as an assurance from Robin that they were searching for her in the right area. They had already heard about the flagman sighting of O'Neill nearby, and after putting two and two together, they were convinced they should concentrate their efforts even more diligently in that area in the days and weeks ahead. A short time later, O'Neill's Chrysler New Yorker had been located. Because the car was in fact stolen, and because it had been driven by O'Neill and was not his own vehicle, coupled with the fact that the car had been abandoned and subsequently impounded by the Washington State Patrol, the car could be searched in relation to the Robin Smith missing person investigation. O'Neill, furthermore, could not expect any rights to privacy regarding the stolen vehicle that he had abandoned. The two detectives working the case, Walt Stout and Terry Wilson, drove to a storage facility where the car was impounded to. It was a weekend, and everything had basically come to a halt. They wanted to do a full examination, but they realized that it couldn't be conducted at that time in the presence of identification officers and criminalists from the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab. Instead, they decided they'd go over the car in a preliminary fashion. They found that the keys were still in the ignition, just as they had been when the trooper that found it had it impounded, and they were wondering why. They considered whether O'Neill might have been frightened by something, such as the presence of a police officer and not wanting to be seen with the stolen car and recognized in connection with the Robin Smith case had fled, or perhaps there were other reasons. They examined the car carefully. It was filthy filled with a large amount of garbage, paper sacks, blankets, food papers, and empty beer cans. They discovered a sleeping bag inside as well, a fishing pole, a backpack, hunting knife inside a leather sheath, other outdoor equipment, and several articles of dirty clothing. However, Stout and Wilson's attention was quickly drawn to a large quantity of blood inside the trunk, which was now dried. Much of the blood had soaked into the left side of the trunk's inner cardboard panel and into the carpet covering the panel, but they also noticed that there were significant blood spatters on the interior underside of the trunk lid. The spatters, they noted, appeared to be of low to medium velocity in origin, consistent with those that might have been caused by a downward and side-to-side flinging motion of something heavy, perhaps while held in someone's hand, such as a hammer. They were careful not to disturb anything. As I said, this was just a cursory examination until it could be thoroughly gone over by crime lab personnel. But they soon noticed a lavender ski jacket, one that appeared to match the description of one reportedly worn by Robin Smith when she was last seen. It was small and appeared to be the same type that a young female would wear, and it too was heavily stained with blood. Because of the severity of what they'd found, neither Stout or Wilson examined the contents of the trunk any further. Instead, they focused their attention back to the interior of the car. They found a receipt on the floorboard near the front passenger seat it had been issued by the Safeway store in Enumclaw, and it was dated the day after Robin had been last seen. It suddenly became very significant to both of the detectives, as the information coincided with the reported sightings of Darren O'Neill and the Chrysler in the east part of Pierce County, near Greenwater and Crystal Mountain, on the weekend that Robin disappeared. The receipt also verified a reported sighting of O'Neill from a Safeway store clerk, who had reported serving him that weekend. Now they were faced with reporting what they had found to Edna Smith, along with the other family members. It wasn't going to be an easy task, especially with all the blood. Based on the bits and pieces that they had been learning about Darren O'Neill, coupled with the fact that they would found a stolen Chrysler with the blood and other items found in the trunk, it began to look more and more to Wilson and Stout that O'Neill might very well be a serial killer. They needed a lot more to back up such a theory, of course. Their investigation had really only just begun. They began looking at other victims that had been found, victims' bodies that had been found, missing persons, etc., that might fit similar profiles as that of Robin Smith. Their efforts eventually paid off. He was linked to other victims, one in Bellingham, Washington, another in eastern Oregon, By this point, it was looking more and more like it was becoming an interstate case. The FBI entered the picture, and as a result, a nationwide manhunt ensued. When they gathered more information, linked O'Neill to the victim in Bellingham, 
they decided they put him on their 10 most wanted list. In the meantime, Edna and Jim Cheney and other family members continued their searches in Greenwater. This had gone on for quite some time. Edna was literally out there spending her days on her knees, digging here, digging there, trying to find anything that might lead to the remains of her daughter. One day in particular, as Edna continued her digging and thinking constantly about Robin and recalling memories, fond memories of her childhood and her short adult life, she and Jim Cheney began finding things. Among the things that they uncovered were teeth, small bones, fingernails, and so forth. At the end of each day, they took what they'd found and turned it over to the crime lab. The crime lab, as well as the detectives, had a hard time believing they were finding these things because of the professionals that had previously gone over the area and found nothing. A short time later, one of the first pieces that Edna and Jim turned over was a fragment of a maxilla, two maxillary teeth, fragments of bone from the cranium, and a fragment of bone from the mandible. Concentrating on the area where all of these items are found, Edna found another large bone, some joints, knuckle bones, more fingernails, hair, and additional teeth. By the time they had finished, they had provided the crime lab with enough of the major missing pieces of cranium that Robin's skull could now be reconstructed. Before leaving the Greenwater area, giving up their search, satisfied that they had found what remained of Robin, they constructed a small wooden cross and placed it on the area where they had found all of the items. The cross remains there to this day. Amazingly, in retrospect, this search in the deep woods where they found what was eventually identified as Robin Smith was within 20 to 30 yards of where the family had been searching earlier. They had come close to this area, but hadn't searched it. Something, on the other hand, had compelled Edna to go farther. By doing so, she had found what she really didn't want to find. In the meantime, Robin Smith's fiancé, Laren Crowston, had become despondent over Robin's death. He blamed himself for leaving her at O'Neill's party, but there had been little that he could have done otherwise. He began drinking, and he was taking pills from doctors that had prescribed medications to him to help him. On one occasion, he apparently had drank too much. His body was found. He had actually died from drowning on his own vomit. Some people suspected suicide, others didn't. Edna Smith concluded that Laren had not taken his own life, but he had simply died of a broken heart. By now, reported sightings of Darren O'Neill had been coming in from all over the country, from the Pacific Northwest all the way to Colorado to Louisiana, on to Florida. He was eventually traced to Florida, driving in another stolen vehicle, and he was going under the name of John Mayo a variation of a name that he had taken from a Louis L'Amour novel. At one point, he tried to evade capture in Florida for a traffic violation. He was arrested. But he slipped by the cops in Louisiana and Florida because they failed to initially compare the fingerprints of John Mayo with other wanted people. And he had pled guilty to trying to flee from the police officer, an obvious attempt to avoid further detection. Still insisting that his name was John Mayo, Darren O'Neill was eventually extradited to Louisiana from Florida on Wednesday, December 30, 1987, after several delays. Shortly after his arrest in Lakeland, Florida, he had pleaded guilty to fleeing the officer for driving without a license, for which he was sentenced to 30 days in jail. He was also sentenced to another 45 days in jail after pleading no contest to credit card theft and resisting arrest. He had fought the extradition, but it was finally approved by a Florida judge who decided that he must face the charges in Louisiana. With his true identity still unknown to the police, he was booked into the Jefferson Parish Correction Center in Gretna, a New Orleans suburb, to await trial. Compounding the confusion over his true identity, he was booked in Gretna under the name John Mayo. Upon his arrival in Gretna, O'Neill was routinely fingerprinted. Afterwards, his fingerprint cards were sent to the Louisiana State Police Bureau of Criminal Identification in Baton Rouge. Nearly a month later, and only a few days before Mayu was to go before a judge for a bail hearing, the fingerprint cards landed, thankfully, on the desk of Kathleen Dramillion, a 32-year-old astute rookie officer who fortunately had a keen eye for detail. Instead of Processing the cards in the typical routine manner, in which case they would have just been filed away, something about the name Mayu bothered Dramillion. It sounded fictitious to her. Acting on a gut feeling, Dramillion began examining hundreds of sets of fingerprints in the state's files, including many of criminals wanted nationally by the FBI, aided by a magnifying glass and a computer. Finally, she scored big and positively identified Mayu's fingerprints as those of Darren O'Neill's. 
She was pleased that she had made the knockoff, as such discoveries were called by the police, but she was shocked to learn that she had found a criminal on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Everyone, of course, was naturally delighted over the fact that O'Neill had been identified, not only because he was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, but because it meant that he would be kept behind bars. Keeping him incarcerated effectively broke the repetitive cycle of killing, which had, up to his arrest in Florida, been driven by fantasy and impulse. Breaking the pattern of a serial killer was something that behavioral scientists still had been unable to accomplish except by keeping him behind bars and out of circulation. It was soon noted that he was wanted for murder in Pierce County, Washington, and so the Louisiana authorities notified Pierce County authorities of the identification. Detective Walt Stout, of course, in turn, notified Edna Smith of the news. Although crying uncontrollably, she was ecstatic upon hearing the details of O'Neill's identification, and she took comfort in knowing that he was now behind bars, for he could not hurt another woman. Stout, along with Bellingham detectives, flew immediately to Louisiana to interview O'Neill. However, O'Neill would not speak to any of them beyond relating that he hadn't made up his mind whether or not he would fight extradition to Washington. Nonetheless, weeks later, Washington Governor Booth Gardner signed the necessary extradition papers to have O'Neill return to Pierce County. In the weeks that followed, Darren O'Neill began playing games with the system. Despite his fingerprint identification, he insisted that he was not Darren O'Neill. Everyone knew better, of course, but O'Neill forced the issue into the courts in order to delay his extradition. To make matters even worse, the state of Louisiana didn't want to give him up to the state of Washington until after he had been tried for stealing a car and money there. Edna, of course, became infuriated. She began hounding the authorities in Pierce County. After being told that there was little they could do for her, she began writing letters to Louisiana Governor Buddy Romer. She made it clear she wasn't going to stand for any more bullshit from a system that seemed to her to be more interested in protecting Darren O'Neill's rights than in seeing that justice was properly served. Nonetheless, in time, Darren O'Neill was, of course, extradited to Washington. Darren O'Neill ended up pleading guilty to the murder of Robin Smith, and that, of course, resulted in a lighter sentence for him in Washington State. He was ultimately found guilty. He was sentenced to a life prison term. There's another aside to the story, and that aside is the fact that he was wanted for a rape in Portland, Oregon, of a young teenage girl. It's a very violent rape, which I describe at the beginning of the book. It sort of sets the stage for what kind of person O'Neill is. He was, of course, eventually convicted in Oregon as well and sentenced to a number of years there. Years which he would have to spend in Oregon after gaining parole from Washington, if in fact he did gain parole. The judge who sentenced O'Neill to Robin Smith's murder looked at him in the courtroom and told him, Personally, I'd be inclined to impose the death penalty on you, but my personal feelings have no place in this. The judge then sentenced O'Neill to 27 years and 9 months in prison to be served at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. The judge noted that O'Neill could be eligible for parole after serving only 18 years and 6 months, according to a provision for time off for good behavior. O'Neill stood expressionless as he was sentenced. The following year, O'Neill was brought to Portland, Oregon to stand trial for the kidnapping and rape of a 14-year-old girl. He, of course, steadfastly maintained his innocence. The judge there, however, not believing O'Neill's claims of innocence for raping the young girl in Portland, the jury there convicted him of two counts of first-degree kidnapping, three counts of first-degree rape, sexual penetration with a foreign object, three counts of third-degree rape, and single counts of first-degree sodomy, third-degree sodomy, and sexual abuse all under varying theories of law. As a result, O'Neill was sentenced to 135 years in Oregon to be served concurrently when his sentence in Washington State was up. The length of the sentence in Oregon, of course, would be determined by the State Parole Board. I just want to add that this is one of my personal favorite books, in part because I got really close to the family and friends of victim Robin Smith and was able to study the case in great detail much more so than many and it's also been a favorite of my readers all of the details that I haven't revealed here of course can be found in the book this book as well as all of my books is available on my website truecrimeking.com for those of you who engage in social media, such as I do, all of the links to where I can be reached are available on my website, for Twitter, for Facebook, as well as my email address. Thank you for listening to this latest podcast. I hope to have some more out in the near future. Until then, stay tuned.